Welcome, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are very excited to talk today about some of the updates related to anal cancer prevention. And we will be discussing some uh, non-FDA approved treatment during our talk. But today we're gonna just go through a, an overview of HPV infection in the anal site and talk about some of the terminology that is important to understand and, and learn. And then we'll jump into the anchor study itself. And again, Jeff will give us a, a summary or, or a wrap up at the end. And next week, we will have a review of the high resolution anoscopy, what it is, how, how we do it, and some of the treatment options as well, and some of the challenges too. So if you have a specific questions related to the HRA itself and treatment, save those for next week. Why anal cancer is it's worth of our time and consideration. And I think here we can see clearly from a clinical standpoint, anal cancer cases are increasing in the general population. And in these two graphs, I just want to point out that during the same period of time, you can see an, an increased number of anal cancer. And in that same period, we're seeing a decreased number of cervical cancer cases in the U.S. And this is because we have effective screening program for cervical cancer prevention. And the ablation treatment for cervical dysplasia is actually quite effective as well. We now know that there are certain groups in the population that are at higher risk for developing anal cancer. And, and those are uh, particularly our patients living with HIV, one of the highest risk of anal cancer. Men who have sex with men are 35 times more likely to develop anal cancer. And if you add HIV infection, 80 to 130 times more likely to develop anal cancer if you compare uh, to the HIV negative population. And this is despite of having great antiretroviral therapy. And this is in contrast of what we see with other cancer like Kaposi sarcoma that you know, we don't see those anymore in the anti or, or, or fewer in the antiretroviral area, but uh, we're definitely seeing more and more HPV related cancer. One thing that I want to point out that anal cancer is preceded by precancerous cells called high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions or HCL. So that's a term that we will use uh, quite a lot. So, and I will go over that uh, term in uh, more detail in a moment. So again, just some big numbers here. Five out of 10 asymptomatic men, uh, HIV, living with HIV MSM, uh, will have high-grade lesions. So it showing out or pointing out that the, the actual precancerous or the high grade lesions are fairly frequent, very prevalent. And one in 10 patients who are living with HIV and have sex with men will get anal cancer over the last lifetime. Again, these are all estimations. Hopefully we'll get some more updated numbers now with that uh, we have the anchor study as well. And among women patients living with HIV, two out of 10 will have anal high-grade dysplasia as well. But we don't know for sure what is the estimate number of anal cancer or the risk of cancer in this population yet. Some of the known risk factors associated with anal cancer, the main one is having a persistent HPV infection with the oncogenic types, particularly HPV 16 and 18. So that has been well described. Age is another factor, older age, uh, having a low CD4 count. Uh, smoking is also uh, associated with less clearance of HPV infection. And having HPV lesions or infection at other sites, for example, in the cervix, also is another risk factor for uh, associated with anal cancer. And uh, lastly, the genital warts. And we often think that genital warts are caused by the non-oncogenic HPV types, but we frequently see an association or a co-infection of genital warts with some of the high risk or oncogenic types. All right, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here just so again, we can understand the terminology and, and the natural history. 
And remember that HPV is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections and pretty much anyone who is sexually active will get it at, at least once in their lifetime. And the HPV will infect that basal layer here at, at the bottom of the layer of the stratified squamous epithelium. So basically infects the skin and the, the HPV gets to that bottom layer through microabrasion. So, and once it gets to the, that basal layer, it just take over the cells and the genome um, will, will start the, the replication and amplification. And the cells will start making or having these changes that we can actually see that on the cytology or pathology. So in, when we take biopsies. So normally the, the cells will die at, when they get to the top of the epithelium, they will just die and, and fell off. But when there is an HPV infection, the cells will again change the morphology and then just direct a continuous growth in, in the cell division. And th these changes, what again we see on the path in cytology and historically, we used to think about HPV as a gradual progression to invasive cancer. And the lesions were called intraepithelial neoplasia. And depending on the site, they will be either anal intraepithelial neoplasia or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Here, for example, is the A represent the anal. So AIN is the anal intraepithelial neoplasia. And then we'll grade them, grade one, grade two, grade three, again, thinking that that was the, the natural projection or progression rather of this, the HPV infection. But now we know that a substantial proportion of these lesions will never go or develop a, into a cancer. Okay, so having the high-grade lesions is very common, but developing or, or turning into a cancer is, is actually not that common. And, and that's a question that patients will ask very frequently. Okay, so the newer terminology only includes two tiers, which is the low grade squamous intraepithelial lesions or the high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, so LCL or HCL. And that's what we should use for denomination or of these lesions. And you can see here the AIN grade one and all of the warts are under this denomination or classification of low grade lesions. And at the AIN2, the grade two and the grade three are now the high grade lesions, okay? And pay attention that you also sometimes will see frequently a, a diagnostic, uh, a pathology re report saying in situ carcinoma. And that sounds scary for patients. It, it sounds like a cancer, but they are not cancer. They are high grade lesions, okay? But we also know that these high-grade lesions, when they invade the, the stroma, that's when a cancer develop. And, and that's where the prevention strategy comes from, thinking that if we find the high-grade lesion and we get rid of the high-grade lesions, we will prevent a cancer from happening. Okay, and this is what we see in the cervix, and this is how we model the same, again, natural history in the anal canal as well. I know that was a lot of information, but I think it's important to understand the terminology and, and the natural history so you can provide that information to your patients. And the ANCHOR study or the Anal Cancer HCL Outcomes Research Study is a, a national a multicenter study funded by uh, the National Institutes of Health with the primary objective to determine whether, again, treating those high-grade lesions is effective or will reduce the incidence of anal cancer. And the study was conducted only in patients living with HIV. And again, this is to evaluate in a very similar way of what we know from the cervix and how we prevent uh, cervical cancer. So these are some of the, the numbers here, recruitment goals from the study with a target enrollment of about 5,000 volunteers. Again, all patients living with HIV 35 years old or older, and they are invited to the clinic for a, in a screening visit where we will do a high resolution endoscopy. And during that exam, if we find a high grade lesion, they are eligible for the study and they can be randomized either to a monitoring arm or an intervention arm. 
And the difference is uh, here in this, between these two arms is that in the intervention arm, we will treat lesions, high-grade lesions, when they, we find them on the biopsy. So they come to the clinic every six months for a digital anal rectal exam. So we do a, a good rectal exam. Then we do the anoscopy and take biopsies as needed. We collect some samples, including anal swabs and, and blood samples as well. And again, if they are in the monitoring arm, they come every six months. We take a look, we do a good exam. And then if we need to biopsy, we take another biopsy. And in the intervention arm, as we find the high grade lesions, they come for treatment with different modalities. We'll go over those as well. So if they reach the endpoint, meaning if we find cancer in their biopsies, they exit the study because at that point, again, they, they reach the endpoint and they are referred to for treatment. Now, if we don't find cancer, again, they come back every six months for the follow-up exam. Before I move to the next slide, I just want to make mention is that the goal is to retain the participants for at least five years. And the estimation was that 50 people will develop cancer during the study follow-up. I just want to add from this slide that they receive a compensation also uh, for, for their visits. And here again, I have the primary objective, again, whether treating these high relations is going to help reducing the incidence of cancer. And other objectives are also uh, evaluating how safe are the treatments that we're using for the participants. And we're going to also look for some viral and host factors associated with a progression of this lesion to a cancer. Good points that I want to uh, mention here are some of assumptions because uh, that will be interesting to compare with the uh, results. So the study assumes an incidence rate of anal cancer of 100 per 100,000 among all participants with or without a, a prevalent lesion. But if half of the population develops that high grade lesions, then the incidence of cancer in those with it, an actual prevalent high grade lesion, the expectation was 200 per 100,000. Again, we'll come back to this number in a moment. Different sites across the US for the study and uh, the main or, or the PI of the study is Dr. Joel Paleski at the University of California in San Francisco, UCSF. And here in Seattle, we have a site, Harborview, Virginia Mason, and uh, we used to have a site at the polyclinic uh, as well. Let me just say that th this is our enrollment locally here. We're expected to screen 17,000 people for the study. We thought we'd screen, have about one out of three people screening. So these are asymptomatic people being screened. And we'll come to that later in terms of who should be screened in the future. But we only had to screen 10,000. We actually found a higher prevalence of HL in this population. So we only screened under 11,000 during all almost 5,000. We thought it'd be 17,000. So that's significant. And you can see that the numbers that we've screened and enrolled here at Harborview, Virginia Mason Polyclinic, and these are the current people on study here locally. I would say the most common reason why someone wasn't eligible after screening was they didn't have HL, about three quarters of the people. There were a few other reasons why someone wasn't able to be enrolled. We had to be sure we were able to do an adequate exam and treat the lesions if they got randomized to treatment. So this is the population that got randomized here, the 4,446 people as of the DSMB meeting that occurred in September. This study was presented at Croy at a special session on February 15th by Joel Polevsky. These are screenshots from there. So here, here you see the total randomization is well balanced. The median age, a couple of the important things here was about 50 years of age. The eligibility was 35 and over for the study. Um, there's a lot of age chill in people 20 year olds, but they never develop anal cancer at that age. So no need to worry about them at that age. The median years uh, sent with HIV diagnosed was 17 years. So this is a population living long-term with HIV, average age about 50, followed an average of over two years on study, and about 80% men, 15% women. We made a real effort to enroll transgender women in this study, and we did, we, we did reasonably well for a study like this. The other thing we're, we're proud of is, is this was a very diverse population uh, for an HIV study. So 30% were non-Hispanic whites, about 40% were African-Americans and um, Hispanic non-African-Americans were 15 to 
So this is a, a pretty diverse population. If you see by CDC risk factor, primarily but not exclusively MSM, uh, a number of heterosexual IBDU being a common risk factor here in this population as well. This is the stratification at, at baseline. So in terms, we stratified for two factors at baseline. We stratified for Nader CD4, and we stratify for extent of HL. This is very subjective, but it, it's hard to quantitate disease with HL, but we stratified. So, you know, the majority of people had less than 50%, but we did have 12% of people had over 50% of the anal canal or perianal region involved with HL. And for NADA CD4, you see this is a population 50-50 balance with NADA 200. This is reflective, I think, of the long-term HIV um, duration in the people in the study that half of them actually started antiviral therapy when their data was below 200. So the, by design, the DSMB was notified when there were 30 cases. This is a clinical endpoint study, so you don't really know how many endpoints you're going to accrue until you actually see them developing. This study started enrolling in 2015, so we were expecting this study to finish enrollment early next year and follow people another five years. So we we're expecting a result in 2027. Fortunately, we have the result now because we had 32 cancers diagnosed. Nine were diagnosed with invasive cancer in the treatment arm, the group that had ablations, and 21 in the active monitoring arm. So because of that significant difference between the higher rate of cancer in the active monitoring arm than the treatment arm, the DSMB stopped the study for enrollment. These are the curves, the Kaplan-Meier curves here from time to anal diagnosis. And as you can see, there's a continued separation in favor of the active monitoring arm having more cancers. So the treatment arm was more ver quite effective in reducing the cumulative incidence of anal cancer. The relative risk reduction is 57%, highly statistically significant. But I, I wanna point these out. Helen mentioned the expectation of about 100 cases per 100,000 or 200 in a combined group. We actually had double that. So the active monitoring on cancer incidence rate is 400 per 100,000. This is by far the highest incidence of cancer we've seen in any study of people living with HIV. And even in the treatment arm with a 57% reduction, we still have 173 per 100,000 invasive anal cancers. So we still need a lot more to go on treatment, but treatment did reduce the incidence by 57%. There was a lot of debate whether treatment would reduce it at all. So the fact that we, we proved it did and did it much earlier than we thought, we, this is a major, uh, major finding. So the DSMB recommending actually stopping enrollment in the study, not stopping the study. We're continuing to follow people in the study for another two, two and a half years. We're, we are bringing back everyone who's been to the monitoring arm and offering them treatment. I think it's really curious when we were randomizing these people, the entry visit was kind of a strange visit because you actually had brought the person in they got randomized to either go forward with treatment that day or have no treatment. And, it, and so either they had a major ablation or they had no treatment based on a randomization on that visit. I would say virtually everyone who got randomized to monitoring was quite happy with not having to go through treatment that day. And we had very few people cross over who decided they wanted treatment after the fact, which was a concern about this study conduct early on, if that would happen frequently and it didn't. But everyone that I brought back now who's in a monitoring arm has agreed to treatment knowing that treatment reduces cancer risk by 57%. I haven't had a single person I brought back yet who has not wanted to have the HCL treated. And we'll continue to follow all individuals who wish to be treated or not for until August of 2024. I would highlight three big rationales why this study was done. One is there is a significant spontaneous regression rate of HCL in people without treatment. And we in fact saw that about 30% of the active monitoring patients have the lesions regress without treatment. The other is, is the need for recurrent treatments. There'll be other papers published here soon about the treatment outcomes here, but about half the people need a multiple treatments. So this is not a one and you're done kind of treatment. Many people need multiple treatments. And the third is the risk of progression of cancer is pretty low. You know, there are 30 cancers and 4,500 people, but still it's a significant reduction in cancer risk by treating them. Adverse events were very, very minimal. The treatment is electrocautery hyfrication we use by most sites. This takes about 15 minutes. Uh, recovery is not that difficult for the participants. Um, very few major AEs here. These are all just very minor AEs related to the cautery. So what are the implications of the anchor study? And this is, again, these are from Joel's slides when he presented this at Croy on the 15th of February. 
So treatment of anal HCL is effective in reducing the anal cancer risk, 57% reduction. These data should be included in an overall assessment of the inclusion of green and foreign treating anal HCL as a standard of care. There is a need for optimization of the screening algorithms, and we'll talk about that in terms of implications for implementation here. There's a need for a large scale up of HRA training programs. And as Helen said at the beginning, next week, I'll talk about what, what's involved. I started our clinic here at Harborview 10 years ago last month, February of 2012. It's, a, it's been a long haul to develop a clinic here, train other people. The issue is also about extrapolation of these results to other groups at high risk. We see people with solid organ transplant, bone marrow transplants, other significant immunosuppression. We think this data would also apply to those populations as well, but there'll never be an anchor study for post-transplant participants. This was about an $80 million study that's been 10 years in the making. There will not be another randomized treat or no treat study of anal dysplasia in any population. So in terms of who do we screen, where do we go from here? How do we implement this? We do not have the capacity locally, nor do many cities in the country have the capacity to screen everyone living with HIV who's 35 years and older. You know, the vast majority of people we see with anal HL are asymptomatic. Almost all of them have normal careful digital anal rectal exams. So that doesn't highlight the population. Visual anoscopy in the clinic without acetic acid and iodine, as we'll talk more about next week, is, is, is not very effective at finding these lesions. So what about other things like co-testing with anal cytology? So this is a, a, a nice paper published just this past year in JID, looking at a couple of different algorithms. People have looked at whether HPV co-testing would allow you to target a group of people after an anal pap smear or moving on to high resolution anoscopy. The problem is that unless you have a benign or no neoplasia on pap smear, any abnormal anal cytology can be associated with a significant yield of high grade dysplasia on HRA exam, whether it's ASCIS, L cell, what's called ASCH is atypical cell suspicious for high grade or H cell. All of these people need to go on probably to have anoscopy. So you can screen out a few people living with HIV, but only a minor number of people are going to have a truly negative uh, cytology. And the other issue with HIV co-testing, Helen mentioned the type 16 and 18. There are, you know, there are a lot of other types of high-risk types. We haven't run the HPV swabs for anchor yet to know if there's going to be a significant reduction, if, if all of the cancers are attributable to 16 and 18 or not. Those samples haven't been run yet. Uh, but they will be. The problem is H high risk HPV is so prevalent in a population of HIV positive people, particularly MSM, that it doesn't help you segregate out a group their benefit from HRA like it does in the cervix. So this is a problem. So this is one, one algorithm that was evaluated where you look at co-testing and, and look at it in the group with benign, then co-test there. But this doesn't really help you that much. The next slide I think is the other algorithm which I think came out a little bit more favored in, in the analysis was this algorithm in this kind of risk benefit analysis or cost-effective analysis is that you would do the cytology and, and do the co-test in the ASCIS, including a benign. And, and you also get a significant number of unsatisfactory cytologies as well. Even if you're experienced in doing it, you still get occasional unsatisfactory cytologies and maybe use co-testing in that population and move on to HRA with the groups that have high-risk HPV. But co-testing doesn't help you in this population at all because you find a lot of HCL in people with L-cell, ASCH, and HCL, and you find a lot of high-risk HPV on co-testing. So this algorithm would move this group on as well. But the ones that are the greatest risk for developing cancer are probably people older, age 50 and over, living with HIV for a long time, and having a nadir CD4 below 200. Um, current CD4 wasn't a predictor. You know, virtually everyone on the ankle study was on effective antiviral therapy with T-cell counts well over 200. So I think that's a population to think about at least initially looking at more carefully. Older people, people living longer with HIV and native CD4 is below 200. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.